So today I will um, seek your feedback. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Um, on um, the our recent results, this was a PhD thesis uh, in physics by John Berkowitz, who recently graduated and now works in information security. Um, on uh, how to read out neural responses, and the claim is with inf without information loss, and uh, how they should be structured, which I think match. You know, I will argue matches how real at least a substantial fraction of neural responses matches the criteria, uh, at least approximately. And um, in this way, we, um, if they're structured in a certain way, then they can be read out without information loss. So, um, and um, so it is a theory seminar, but um, I want to give you my uh, overture for the approach, theoretical approaches that we will use and motivation for seeking ideal codes. So there is a concept in psychology called schema plus correction. So if I wanted to explain to you what this is, I have to tell you, well, this is a Coke bottle that has been crumbled. So that's my approach to um, why use theory and idealized codes, information preserving codes in neuroscience. We would like to find out the ideal um, code that um, has maximally efficient properties. And they say then, then the real code has been uh, crumbled or has some noise added to it, but that's the ideal. So the, today I prepared uh, two parts for the talk. The first, the bulk of the talk is um, on this lossless um, encode and decoding scheme. And then the second part is um, um, some technical issues for how to quantify information conveyed by large neural populations. So I will describe a formula and uh, exact formula plus um, three approximations that make that, uh, that are, um, that offer different trade-off between difficulties of computing and um, accuracy. So uh, how to read out, um, neural population activity, of course, it's a problem on which many people, including many who are on this call, um, have been working on. So I, I look forward to your feedback. So the classical way um, is uh, the so-called population vector. So it was proposed by Jergopoulos and colleagues a few years back. And um, so they were monitoring um, they worked in the uh, motor system, um, but the method is general and has since then been applied to play uh, everywhere in the nervous system. So in the case of the motor neurons, so this is a figure from their experiment. So they're recording from monkey motor cortex and they're observing what kind of movement the monkey is making. So if it is making the movement, um, say down to the um, left, I guess, um, from the monkey's perspective, then that particular neuron that they're recording from has produces lots of spikes. If um, the vector is in the opposite direction, then there are very few spikes. So one can then, then they proceed to summarize the, all of these data by saying that this neuron has a preferred direction or receptive fields for sensory neuron that is down to the right. So then for each neuron, we characterize its selectivity by describing its preferred direction. And, um, and then the population vector that they construct is um, um, this vector for each neuron times the number of spikes that that neuron produced. And curiously, another one, the point is that the spikes um, contribute both when they're produced and when they're not produced. So um, you, one can use different normalizations, but 
when the movement, the animal makes movement in the opposite direction, that um, and the neuron produces essentially say zero spikes, then the neuron will be um, voting for the opposite of its preferred direction. And of course, it's a very attractive um, approach because um, it's simple. And uh, as you can see, it can be um, defined anywhere. Um, for visual neurons, it will be a preferred stimulus pattern instead of W times uh, the spikes of, of each neuron. And then we, we add these patterns across the neural population and we get a reconstruction, the pattern um, that was most likely represented by this neural population activity. So this method also is used in brain machine interfaces, um, been used in eye movements, um, in the hippocampus to read out position of the neuron um, based on the place cell activity. And for example, in this case, the W will be the, um, the kind of the place field that are added according to the number of spikes of each neuron. So it's a very simple um, and efficient way. And for the most part, it works well. However, um, because it's such an appealing uh, statement, it was also tested in detail. And when we test it in detail, people have found that it, it cannot be the whole story. So one of the key assumptions that was tested is that spikes from neurons that are tuned to the same stimulus can be averaged. So it doesn't matter what um, kind of the identity of the neuron doesn't matter, only what matters is its receptive field. So <clears throat> here is one study from Jonathan Victor's group um, uh, a few years back. So they compared the, <clears throat> these are similarly tuned neurons from one part um, with this tetrode. So to the first approximation, we can ignore differences in the receptive fields. And they say, well, let's compare population count with the so-called labeled line code. So labeled line code takes <clears throat> into account which specific neuron produces spike. So in the simple case, um, to explain labeled line, suppose you have neuron one, two, and three. And neuron one responds to stimulus one, but not to anything else. Neuron two responds to stimulus two, but nothing else. And neuron three responds to stimulus three and nothing else. So using this construction, if we have a code like this, then um, I, by observing which neuron produces spike, I can tell you exactly which stimulus was there. But if I sum this, I lost all information. So that's uh, a qualitative in intuition for why population count loses information compared to the labeled line code. And if we ignore differences between um, preferred stimulus directions for these neurons, then that's a population vector approach. And it says that the labeled line code was conveyed much more information. And the question that was raised um, in this paper saying this labeled line code conveys more information, but how can it be implemented in the brain? Because the identity in how to read it out, how to use it, because the, it should be very complicated code. So what I will be driving towards is that there is an intermediate solution that is not so complicated, but nevertheless can account for these results in others. So in the case of the Jonathan Victor publication, so this is this publication here, uh, the receptive fields were similar but not identical. So then there is another study, this time from uh, Bill Bialik, uh, by Leslie Osborne, Stephanie Palmer, Steve Lisberg, and Bill Bialik, that by construction ask um, that um, how would this neuron represent, how different neurons represent stimuli that deviate from their preferred um, direction of motion. And uh, <clears throat> so by construction, the all stimuli have the same preferred direction, but, and they even normalized their firing such that they had the same peak, 
but the tuning curves had different widths. So then they simulate how well actually re realign the spikes, um, re real spikes and say, <clears throat> this is how this cell responds when the stimulus is say at 10 degrees compared to its preferred direction. And this is how this cell responds to a stimulus which is 10 degrees off from its preferred direction and so on. And then, we, uh, then they compare the information carried in the count, that is the total, popula um, pre, uh, the total um, activity of this population. So by construction, it has um, the same preferred orientation, uh, same preferred stimulus. And um, compared to words, words is the labeled line of code. So which means if for this particular highlighted word, it is zero, one, zero, one, <clears throat> zero. And you can see in this figure, so now it's extended to more neurons that there is a dramatic increase in the information available in the words when we take identity of the neurons into account <laughs> compared to counts. So that sets up a dilemma because we know in practice that the population vector works well, but this construction that we are using in different parts of the brain actually um, is losing a substantial fraction of the information and therefore cannot be right. So um, I will discuss how these two discrepancies can be resolved. And the key is actually already was discussed in um, um, this paper, they say, well, what matters is also the width of the tuning. And um, because um, if uh, uh, the stimulus is um, somewhere on the outskirts, then um, maybe the broad tuning neuron would respond, but the narrow tuning neuron would not respond. And therefore, I will be able to figure out that the stimulus one day was on the outskirts, was kind of far from the preferred stimulus of this population. So the key will be that one can actually take this into account with the one single parameter. So um, to do this, and um, I will change uh, perspective a little bit and change gears and um, tell you that while most of the studies of population coding use this description of a tuning curve relative to the preferred orientation. But there is another equally um, used uh, description of neural responses, uh, but which was mostly used for the encoding part of neural responses. So if you have spike probability as a function of the relevant stimulus component, the preferred stimulus um, would be designated as a pattern. And then on the x-axis is projection onto this pattern. So one, this, and then there is some nonlinearity that describes how firing probability increases um, as the, the stimulus matches this preferred pattern. And so what we have is, um, for example, in this model, if it is a logistic nonlinearity, then it has two parameters threshold alpha and the slope um, beta or one over beta. So when you manipulate these two parameters, you can manipulate um, the width and uh, uh, peak of the tuning curve. So for example, if we take, um, keep the threshold, but make the nonlinearity more shallow, the tuning curve will be broader. And if we keep the same um, rise or slope of the nonlinearity, but increase the threshold, then the peak of the tuning curve will go down and the floor will go down. So there is a one-to-one -one transformation between this representation, the so-called linear nonlinear model, linear because we compare the stimulus with the receptive field and nonlinear based on this nonlinearity. And this model has primarily been used in encoding descriptions of neurons and the tuning curve description, which most commonly been used for um, decoding. So the advantage 
Um, turns out there is advantage of thinking uh, in this representation. And this advantage is that if this nonlinearity is a sigmoidal function, which works for many neurons, then um, so the firing rate is one over plus exponential of stimulus matches with the receptive field times this gain. So I normalize the receptive field to unit length. Then we can derive that in this representation, it's easy to derive that there is an sufficient statistics or information preserving population vector. And it is similar to the standard population vector, but it includes um, an extra factor beta, which is um, the slope of this nonlinearity. So it is um, partly intuitive because um, we say that the neuron that is, um, has a sharper nonlinearity and therefore is more robust um, has less noise, will get more weighting in um, um, towards the population vector. So it's kind of a weighted democracy, democracy weighted by, I guess, reputation. And, um, and at the same time, it says here that um, there are also publications saying that the diversity of the tuning matters, but this result says that not all of the diversity of the tuning curve matters, but only a certain combination um, that is captured by this one parameter beta. So the link between the width of the tuning curve here and parameter beta is complicated. It's some kind of a very complicated expression. Um, but it is it exists, it's one-to-one. -one. Uh, threshold alpha and beta determine um, kind of width and peak of the tuning curve. Uh, so the claim is that for uh, to preserve information what is available in the neural responses, you only need to know betas and you don't need to know thresholds for readout. Of course, the thresholds matter because when the thresholds go up and down, the overall information that this neural population provides about the stimulus will change. But to read out what is there, you don't need to know the threshold. So these are the key takeaway points from this um, talk. And we will now test them in various ways. And I will also provide additional intuition for this result. And um, sometimes at this point, um, uh, there is a question um, from the audience that saying that in this model, there are only two free parameters, threshold and the slope of the nonlinearity. And using these parameters, I cannot reproduce all the possible tuning curves that one can imagine to have here. And it's true, but I would argue that, um, that, um, and in fact, so there is a kind of a confound that if we plot the kind of the bottom of the tuning curve and versus which is on this y axis and the modulation, uh, which is the difference between the maximum and the minimum, that the, when I change my two parameters in the LN model, then kind of there is an inverse relationship between these two. I cannot make um, a curve that starts at zero and uh, has a broad modulation. So it turns out that there is indirect evidence in support of this. So this is another um, publication, but if you focus on one of their um, key takeaway points, they would say that neurons with strong multiplicative effects, so on the kind of um, tuning curve, have weak additive effects from modulation. So from my perspective, it's a supportive, although indirect evidence that the neural tuning curves vary in ways that conform to the, um, the structure where it is a sigmoidal function with threshold and, and differences in slope. So now maybe more direct tests. So there are two main conclusions from so far in this um, talk that we would like to propose a change from a standard population vector where the voting by neurons is their preferred feature times the number of spikes they produce 
to the same voting times the scaling factor that describes how reliable the neurons are. So if a neuron has a sharper nonlinearity, then um, their responses carry a lot of weight. Either this neuron produces a spike or doesn't produce a spike will have a strong impact on the population average. And a neuron with a shallow tuning curve, that um, impact of that firing um, from that neuron has some impact, but not too much. So here is a, a simulation. It is designed to test the case that was set up by, uh, tested by Leslie Osborne together with uh, Steve Lisberg and um, Bill Bialik and Stephanie Palmer. So we have a simulated population where all the neurons have the same preferred direction. They have different um, widths of their nonlinearity. And, um, and then we compute um, direct information carried by this um, um, population in the black line. And the red line is information preserving population vector, which fully captures information. And the classic population vector, which is, in this case is a count, because um, they all have the same st preferred stimulus. And so one can take that vector out of the sum. So that reproduces the results um, um, on kind of previous discrepancy that Yes, just by taking this factor beta, you can capture, um, fully capture information that is contained in neural population and you don't need anything else. So another one is um, now maybe tested more broadly. Uh, what if in a population that has now different uh, receptive fields or different preferred stimuli? So. Here is an example where you have a subpopulation with uh, tuned around one stimulus and another subpopulation tuned around another stimulus. And again, one gets the same effect that information preserving population vector captures full information that we can compute directly from uh, observing patterns of neural responses. And the classical population vector does not capture this information. So it, at this point, I think some intuition about how, how is that possible. So I will um, argue that this is just a remapping of neural responses. So we think typically that neurons, each neuron can produce, um, say, in a binary model, either 0 or 1. So with two neurons, you can have four patterns. None of them are producing a spike. And if this is their preferred stimulus, suppose um, we are considering the case with two-dimensional stimuli, then they can have uh, four possible patterns. So when none of them are spiking, when one is spiking but not the other, so these two values, and when they both are spiking. So instead of thinking of the neural responses as two to the n, um, different patterns, in this case four, we can say that there are four different values that a population vector can take. So it's a mapping from um, kind of abstract um, sequences of zeros and ones or words in the language of uh, papers from Bill Bialik to the values of a single two-dimensional vector. So why, why is that advantageous? Because suppose we now talk about three neurons. So three neurons is eight patterns. So when the third neuron is zero, we are back to the same four patterns. Plus, if we add the third neuron with its preferred uh, stimulus, then when that neuron is firing, we get a new pattern, plus um, the shift in Kind of all of these patterns shifted when by the when the third neuron is firing. So, but the critical observation is so these are complicated sequences, but they can be mapped to the values of a two-dimensional vector if the receptive fields of neurons live in two dimensions, 
and that takes eight values. So now if we have many neurons, then the more neurons you have, the more values of these um, population vector uh, will take. But ultimately, these are just values in a, say, two-dimensional plane. So one can even maybe coarse grain this plane and say, well, these are, um, if I don't have the capacity to resolve different values of the population vector, I, I bend these results and I only say, look for a small number of squares in this grid and, and say how much information I will capture if I just keep track of which segment in this plane the, the neural risk um, kind of population vector happened. Um, and uh, so some of the figures that I shown previously actually have this um, of course graining. Um, I didn't say that because um, um, we were not ready for, for this, but actually these dots here is um, a simulation where instead of taking all possible values of the population vector, in this case, we bend them into fin 15 values. And um, you can see there is a very slight decrease between a full information line, which is in black, versus these little dots that are obtained by coarse, grain, coarse graining the values of the information preserving population vector. Okay. So um, um, maybe uh, I'm, is it a good time to ask for questions or questions are designated to the, to the end? Okay. So question another- Question at the end. Question at the end. Okay. So um, another simulation or uh, another intuition is what's the difference between information preserving versus classical population vector? Um, so they both have um, construct population vectors, but in this case, neurons, the difference comes when we have neurons that have the same preferred stimulus, for example, as exemplified here. And um, so in this case, um, we have neuron one produces a spike, we get to this point. Neuron one and three produces a spike, we get to this point. And, um, um, and similarly here, um, but, um, and when this neuron by itself produces a spike, we get to a smaller point. So this will be a more reliable neuron, this is a less reliable neuron, and this when they're both. So when you have four neurons, uh, two neurons here, you will have four different values. But in the classical population vector, all it matters is the count along the preferred direction. So instead of four patterns, you will get three patterns. So this is one example for how a classical population vector can lose information. But of course, um, so to my mind, this explains why it has been so successful because um, it has the right structure. But on the other hand, um, when we look in detail, it, it will lose information. So another prediction of this theory is that not um, all diversity in the um, tuning curves is important uh, because, um, for example, in this case, we have neurons that have the same preferred um, stimulus and they have different peaks and they have different widths of the tuning curves. But um, in this case, all of this variability is only caused by variation in the thresholds. So in that case, you can compute classic population vector, you can compute information preserving population vector and so on, and um, have full information captured. And again, these are kind of bend responses that 
um, saying that you can coarse grain the values of information preserving population vector and not lose information, essentially. Okay, so now often noise correlations come in as an um, important factor for considering readout and um, uh, accuracy of the neural code. So um, this is an example of a simulation where um, we have neurons that are tuned to different stimuli as before, but now we have noise correlations with them. And in this particular, it doesn't matter what particular noise correlation form you will choose. In this particular case, um, it, it was um, dependent, had different values depending on which pair of neurons there was. But the mathematical conclusion is that you can still use the same readout information preserving population count with or without noise correlations as long as the um, noise correlations do not depend on um, the stimulus set on, on that you are trying to decode. So when noise correlations maybe go up, the information will go down and vice versa, but you can still use the same decoder um, and capture whatever information there is there. Okay. So the mathematical statement is that uh, when we consider the modeling between the transition between stimuli to neural responses, if you can write it down as a product of a function that solely depends on the stimulus, a function that is solely dependent on the neural responses. <clears throat> Plus these noise correlations can be there. They, they're not bothering us. The only part that is critical is that there should be e to the minus some vector times s. And this is the um, whatever vector this is here. It depends on neural responses. And that determines the function, uh, the form of the information preserving population vector. So the summary is that the same readout T uh, that we have been working with works with or without noise correlations. Okay. So, um, and uh, maybe an illustration of how this works. So this is where it comes um, uh, um, my background as an assistant research physiologist. This is the data that I collected in the CAT. And um, so in this case, we have neurons simultaneously recorded. And in black is full information. In the red is information preserving population vector. Um, in blue is spike count and in gray is classic population vector. So the classic population vector is better than the spike count because the preferred orientations of these neurons were slightly different and that provides some venue for conveying information. But you can do better with the information preserving population vector. So, and then maybe inside of this calculation, if you, so this is what's response to natural scenes and uh, responses to different natural scenes um, were in different colors here. So, <laughs> um, and one can see that in the information preserving population color, there is a uh, vector, there is less mixing across different colors compared to the classic population vector. In case one wants to see under the hood of this calculation. So now um, in, um, Maybe a smaller part is um, um, how to compute some strategies for computing um, information um, using this intermediate construction of information preserving population vector. So what I have described in the first part is that so um, information preserving population vector. I, I think what it, it addresses is the the number um, kind of the, the, the curse of dimensionality in the number of neurons. So instead of two to the n, you still monitor a finite vector. So information preserving population vector T has the same dimensionality as the set of receptive fields, 
usually as the stimulus. So, and the dimensionality does not increase with the number of neurons. The number of values that this vector can take increases, but we can coarse grain and keep that under control. So now the question is, the, the claim is that this is the full information, but it can still be a difficult computation because if S is um, say 100 dimensional, you know, if we think of, of a visual neuron and its receptive field on the grid of 10 by 10 points, then this is 100 dimensional and this is 100 dimensional. So it's difficult to compute information between two 100 dimensional vectors. But um, I will describe now a series of three approximations. Maybe there will be others that other people will develop, but this is um, what we have come up with. So if you can write down this uh, full information so far without any loss as um, kind of a sum of um, um, chain rule of information. So first it's information between um, one stimulus component and the corresponding component in the population vector. So you can think of this as, for example, um, in natural scenes or in the correlated Gaussian noise, you have slow frequencies and high frequencies mixed in. So the population vector will have a slow component and the fast component. So first maybe compute information between slow component in the stimulus and this corresponding slow component in the population vector and then add high frequency information. Similarly to how you know pictures are loading on the internet. First they give you a coarse grain version and then um, a higher frequency information. So technically there are some simplifications. Turns out that so it's information between S1 and T1 plus S2 and T2 compared conditional on S1 and so on. So, and then it turns out that one can, due to the structure of this um, information preserving population vector, one can ignore some components in here. So that are greater index than the components that we have already took into account. But still it is um, um, for a hundred dimensional stimulus, we will have a hundred terms in this function. And uh, that wouldn't be so bad, except for these conditional terms. And this is what is really the, the most difficult part in this computation. So because it's so difficult, so we will be starting to approximate. Um, so the first approximation, instead of um, all of these components in the population vector, we will take one matching component plus the relative power of all the components. And it turns out this we call it an isotropic approximation because if inputs are isotropically distributed, this actually is an exact version, exact computation. The second um, approximation, we are not gonna, going to ignore it. So just the matching components, we call it component conditional. So instead of thinking about component of the stimulus and the matching component in the population vector plus all the power in other components, leak kind of term into other components, we ignore it. And then the third component, uh, this third approximation is um, neglect this um, uh, difficult to compute part. And it's, um, we call it component independent because it's exact if the inputs are independent. <clears throat> So now it turns out that this is easiest to compute because this is just uh, information between two variables and uh, they're independently added across many variables. So this is least accurate, but easiest to compute. Then this is more difficult, but more accurate. And we find this is essentially 100% accurate. No, not 100%, but essentially is accurate, but also difficult. So here is um, how it works. So now you can have um, say thousand neurons. <laughs> so the number of neurons is no longer an impediment, but we have in this case to make it manageable, our stimulus is only three dimensional. So you can see these are the receptive fields or preferred stimuli, uh, how they tile the sphere. 
And these are various approximation. In black is the full information, which we can compute with Monte Carlo method. The green and yellow is the uh, isotropic approximation, then component conditional and component independent. So this axis doesn't actually information start at zero. So it is actually, um, I think 80%. So this is about six and the full information here is um, seven. So seven and a half. So I, when I computed it was about 86%. So that's one question. So then there is a question sometimes, in what order should I take these components um, um, when I'm computing information? So uh, of course, it doesn't matter for this approximation here. You can take, uh, these are just additive terms. And, um, but for this one component conditional, it does matter. And roughly the answer means that we take the components that have greatest variance and greatest information first, and then add additional ones. So in this case, these are just two-dimensional stimuli. And what is plotted on the x-axis is the ratio of variance um, in the stimuli um, of component one to two. So below this line one, um, S1 is less important than S2. And above this line one, S1 is more important than S2. So when S1 is more important than S2, then more accurate is this red line here, which is take compute information about S1 first and then add S2. And then these crosses were to this dash line where first take S2, then S1. So this is not a, a theory here, a theorem here, but this is, um, I think, a, a simulation that I think goes with intuition that when we are trying to compute information, we first focus on the component that captures, that has largest information content, and then add subsequent components. Okay, so then another simulation and a cautionary finding. Uh, in this case, it's um, a, a natural stimuli. There are in 100 dimensions. So this is this case of 10 by 10 frames. So because it's 100 dimensional, we can only compute either Monte Carlo simulation or these uh, component independent approximations. And it turns out that <laughs> um, the, com the components need to be independent. So when you with 100 dimensions, how do you select components? You can take them as independent components. And this is this analysis here. And it, it captures a good fraction of the full information. But if you take components that are PCA components that are not really independent, or not even trying to be independent, then one can um, get a result that is more than the true information. So for this component independent approximation, the components have to be independent. So I think this, um, I'm ready to summarize that what I pre presented to you um, is um, that information preserving population factor as weighting by neuronal reliability. And um, the claim is that it can capture that it, it is necessary and sufficient to capture information that is available in neural responses. That this vector, I think, addresses the curse of dimensionality in terms of the number of neurons, but, um, and it works with uh, noise correlation. So kind of an, a nice setup that you can continue to use the same readout, whether or not you have noise correlation as they go up and down, for example. And um, there, there are three ways to approximate exact expression to capture information transmission about high dimensional stimuli because with high dimensions, it's still a problem. So um, the results, you can look for details. So this is more of a technical details and the current opinion gives more of these figures and intuition for the method. So now this is the hello from before the pandemic from my group.
and John Berkowitz is here in the center. Thank you very much and I'm ready to take questions. <laughs>